17 Maxwell's equations. There are four Maxwell's equations. First one is Gauss law. Gauss law is uh, just the integral form or differential form of Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law states that the electric field is a central force and its strength decays according to the inverse square law. Any central force satisfying the inverse square law satisfies Gauss law. And the Gauss law is this. Electric flux coming out of a charge Q is radiating all over the space that is represented by the solid angle D omega. In four dimension, uh, uh, three dimensions, it is four pi. And the Gauss law is nothing but the sum of electric fields multiplied by the cross-sectional area. So this is scalar product, and this is electric flux, and this electric flux is proportional to the charge inside, and there's a multiplicative factor that is called the permittivity constant. It is simply because electric field is proportional to ER over R squared. And surface integral is 4 pi R squared. After coupling this ER, so this one, this one cancels, we have 4 pi, but we began with the electric field definition with the overall factor, one over 4 pi epsilon zero, and this 4 pi kills the denominator 4 pi. And only this guy survives. And numerator, this one, this one is this. And numerator has the charge factor. And the charge is actually contained inside some volume. And this one can be expressed as a volume integral of a charge. And this is a volume integral, this is surface integral. We make use of divergence theorem, then it becomes a divergence and becomes a volume integral. And what we do is just compare this integral, shrink this volume, into a very tiny volume contain on, containing only a single point, then at the end of the day, we find the integrand relation that is called the differential form of Gauss law. This is for the electric field. And if we replace this one B uh, with the magnetic field B, the right-hand side becomes zero. Divergence B equals zero because electric charge is either positive or negative. They are separable, separable. However, magnetic field is due to the North Pole and South Pole. They are intrinsically dipole and sum of dipole charge of the dipoles is exactly zero. That's the reason why we have Gauss law for the magnetic field is this. Sure, the integral, integral form is the same, except that right-hand side is a zero. So we learn two equations among four Maxwell's equations. This is integral form. And this is 
differential form. We have just discussed. The third one is Faraday's law. And Faraday is a very famous for the discovery of this induced electric field due to the changing magnetic field. And still, after the discovery of Faraday, most of our electricity is generated by the Faraday's law. It's a very hot today. We cannot, if without Faraday's law, we have to survive with our hand, hand fan, without air conditioner, without any electricity. You cannot imagine. You have to thank him. It's Faraday's law. Faraday's law here, just like the electric field and magnetic field flux, this phi m can be replaced with as an integral. And we have time derivative. This is total time derivative. However, if you want to take the time derivative of integrand, this is a, this value of position is a fixed when I take the derivative with respect to time. Therefore, this derivative is not a total time derivative, but it is a partial time derivative. After that, this is surface integral. This is surface integral. This is a line integral. However, it is closed, closed circuit. And that closed circuit encloses some surface. So we can always apply Stokes theorem to replace it as a curve scalar product with the surface. And this is surface. And right hand side can be expressed as the integral over a surface, left hand side, two. Therefore, there should be a relationship between the two integrands. That is this. This is the differential form of Faraday's law. So when the time dependence of magnetic field does not exist, then it becomes a zero. What happens? If it is zero, car E equals zero, then any closed path E dot DX, closed path equals zero. If I multiply charge, then F dot DX, close the path equals zero, that means electrostatic force is conservative. However, as soon as this one survives, electric field is not conservative anymore. It is actually conservative in a more general sense because electric field itself is not conservative, instead, the communication between the electric field and magnetic field in total, they are actually conservative. Anyway, if it is zero, what happens? Core of a gradient, this is an operator. This plus product says A cross A equals a zero, right? any cross product of, of a parallel vector is a zero. It is true for the operators too. So curve gradient, it is identically zero. Okay. So if magnetic field does not have time dependence, electric field is completely determined by the electrostatic potential. Potential exists only if in this way. However, 
when the magnetic field flux varies with respect to time, we have to modify this uh, basic theory. That is actually this. Why? The right hand side, left hand side is a core E, and right hand side is this one. And previously in the last class, magnetic field, we learned that magnetic field can always expressed as a core A, where a, a is the magnetic vector potential. If I move this one to the left hand side, now our previous formula for curve E equals zero is not true anymore. However, we have a different form. E has been transformed into this kind of new thing and that is zero. Aha, aha. We can now safely tell a uh, electric field plus time derivative of a magnetic vector potential is identical to gradient phi. And this electrostatic potential still exists. Instead, this is not the electrostatic electric field because electric field is the sum of time independent component and time dependent component. This is the final result. So without this contribution, one cannot explain the Faraday's law. If we, if we do not consider the magnetic vector potential contribution to the electric field, what we can do is just the electrostatic case. That means the charge is always at rest. You cannot solve this kind of dynamic problem anymore. So from Faraday's law, now we modify our elementary theory for to more advanced theory contained that allows the variation time dependent uh, magnetic field. All right, so the last one can be a Ampere's law, but this is not a perfect theory. It is an incomplete theory. Ampere's law was found not by Ampere. It is it is established by Maxwell. The, actually, these are three theory. The discovery of uh, Faraday's law was discovered by, this Faraday law was discovered by Faraday, but this Ampere's law and more interesting one that is called uh, Maxwell's law both of them were completely understood by James Clock Maxwell. And let us first look at the magnetic field generated by physical current, charge flow. When the charge flows, magnetic field is generated. And we learned that the line integral surrounding this magnetic uh, the electric current, then magnetic field rotates in this way. And that integral is mu zero permeability constant multiplied by the current passing through this path. Or that can be expressed as the integral of current density multiplied by the cross-sectional area multiplied by the cosine theta between the angle angle between this uh, cross-sectional area's normal direction and the current density. This I 
once is this i is replaced with the area integral, this closed path integral is now expressed in terms of curvy surface integral. And this surface, this surface, they are identical. As a result, we arrive at the in, uh, differential form of Ampere's law. However, magnetic field can also be created by a parallel plate capacitor. Current I flows in. Yes, we know that the magnetic field surrounds this physical current. Here, current is going out. But what happens between the two plates? There is no charge. There's a vacuum. Even though it is a vacuum, magnetic field is still generated. How? The, due to the current, this plate accumulates electric charge. This plate accumulates opposite electric charge. You know, the electric field between the two plates is a sigma over epsilon zero. If the current comes in, it is sigma is a Q over area, and Q is I times time. Ha uh ha. -huh. What you can see is that if you take the time derivative of the electric field, what happens? It's a I over A. Epsilon zero is here. Why don't we move this one to the left-hand side? What's that? Current divided by the cross-sectional area. Aha, uh -huh. this is of the same dimension. And actually, at this point, it is just like current density. However, there is no physical current. We put a special subscript D to identify this one is effectively physical current, but it is not a physical current. Therefore, we say it is a displacement current. From this, we define this by displacement current. And Maxwell has indeed found that this physical current plus displacement current is the full contribution that generates the magnetic field. It is a famous discovery. And in fact, if we are in a vacuum, divergence E is rho over epsilon zero, but in vacuum, nothing. So vacuum is zero. Magnetic field divergence zero intrinsically. And then Faraday's law gives core E is this. Next, why don't we replace E and B in this manner? Right now, don't forget, uh, don't care about the sign difference. This electric field and magnetic field seems to be symmetric. Sure, there is a, some factor difference. That's a, due to the historical reason. We, we made a mistake to define such kind of stupid definition of the overall factor. Because at that time, Einstein was not there. Anyway, Maxwell expected the symmetry of these two equations, and he actually found after the guess as a physical evidence of this 
displacement column. Let us uh, look at this symmetry called the dual symmetry of electromagnetic field. Perhaps you, you learn that heavy side. Heavy side is uh, famous for this step function. And actually, he patented the coaxial cable. And our current notation for current divergence and any vector calculus was originated from heavy side. The Maxwell's expression was too much complicated, just like Newton's notation for Newton's law of motion was too complicated. So heavy side actually introduced this dual symmetry for the first time. Anyway, I told you magnetic field is not a good notation. C times magnetic field has the correct dimension that is the same as the electric field. If I make a correction in this way, then this is Faraday's law that is to be replaced in such a manner. Okay. And then why don't we multi multiply this or divide this both sides by one over C squared? Aha, one over C squared is actually mu zero epsilon zero. This was the first discovered, this relation was the first discovered by Maxwell. And just like that, this Faraday's law and Maxwell's law has a very nice symmetry called dual symmetry. All right, this is physical current in vacuum. This one disappears, only the Maxwell's law survives. And this Maxwell's law and uh, Faraday's law this is a very important sun, earth, due to this electromagnetic field coming from the sun, propagating in vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. Space is vacuum. These two laws explains the propagation of electromagnetic wave from sun to earth everywhere in vacuum any other wave any other mechanical wave must require medium but according to maxwell's law electromagnetic field does not require any medium and it can propagate in vacuum in addition it's a speed of propagation is the speed of light. And actually, this is the beginning of Einstein's relativity. And this explains how it works. This is vacuum. And you can reproduce this result outside this red and uh, this blue and red part involves the physical current. And this part involves displacement current. There is no charge between the two plates. However, changing electric field generates a magnetic field. So detailed computation are given already. This is the repetition of uh, the derivation of a uh, maxwell ampere law by dual symmetry. So replacing electric field with magnetic field with uh, appropriate sign dependence, you will find this relation. And this problem is explained once again with the actual current 
Magnetic field can be generated from by actual physical flow of charged particle. But here, there is no particle, no charged particle. Only the magnetic, no, electric field. Only the electric field time dependence exists. Then displacement current generates identical magnetic field. That's, that's a quite marvelous discovery by Maxwell. All right. The later part is uh, related to the quantum mechanics. We know orbital angular momentum. Orbital angular momentum is related to the level arm vector and linear momentum and x cross p is the orbital angular momentum. In quantum mechanics, for example, elect, uh, elementary particles such as electron, because proton can also move, but proton is very heavy, and usually proton inside the nucleus traps the electrons, and the electrons are floating around a heavy nucleus. And because this electric, electron has electric charge, there is a current. In the previous class, we learned that ring current generates the magnetic field. And even it makes a magnet, right? Circular current will generate a magnet. And if I combine many things, it becomes a solenoid, something like that. At this moment, I don't want to ask you why these values are quantized. We, we will learn a little bit later. And momentum is quantized. And when you learn, after you learn quantum mechanics, you will know why only these values are allowed, but anyway, it is because of the wave nature of fundamental particles. Just to memorize and basic nature, but it is a just like Bohr model that is wrong. We we cannot say electron is making this beautiful circular motion. No, never. It won't travel such kind of beautiful, symmetric, cyclic path. No, not at all. We, we can find it only through the prob probabilistic way, but we will learn later. But this uh, ball model-like idea. But anyway, this ball magneton is providing us with a fundamental magnet nature that nature gives us. So this is the smallest magnet in nature is generated by electrons motion and the electrons orbital motion is quantized. So this is the smallest magnet size. This, these numbers gives the smallest magnet size and it's the special name is used for ball magneton because it is elementary magnitude of the magnet. There is another kind of magnet that is a spin. Spin does not require the motion of electron. If we turn off the motion of electron, then if this orbital motion is the only source of magnet? No. If we turn off the motion of the electron, still there is a very tiny magnet. Finally, we learned that it is due to spin. And perhaps you know Pauli exclusion principle and Pauli discovered this spin, and he introduced this spin to explain 
the quantum mechanical nature of atoms. So uh, finally, now we know that the fundamental magnet provided by nature is either orbital motion or without orbital motion, electron itself has all its own spin and that gives us non-vanishing magnet. So these two kinds exist. So I hope you don't have to understand in detail, but at least the gold magnet is the fundamental smallest magnet that exists in nature. 